I'd like to start this talk off with a few less words and some sights and sounds from musicians in Southeast Asia that sent me on a quest and a question that I'd like to talk to you about today. So those are some of the sights and sounds that sent me on a quest and a question. Simply, how do you say hello to someone you'll never meet? I know that sounds counterintuitive at first, but I've spent years investing in the answer. And I feel if we can wrestle with this question, we can inspire new forms of creativity and also connect local communities around the world in ways we never expected. My focus and my idea is how we can develop new intercultural exchanges within the arts and technology that ultimately lead to an improvement in international relations. And I call this creative culture diplomacy. That is how we can harness local creativity, utilize the technological tools we have at hand, not, and not only connect local communities, but bring them into some degree of co-authorship. At the heart of creative culture diplomacy is a simple practice, the practice of saying hello, and the practice of speaking to somebody directly and unmediated. So I think, always think it's useful to recognize the powerful though and experience that we have almost every day. We all know what it's like to walk towards a stranger on the street, right? And it's either, sometimes it's ambivalence, sometimes it's fear, sometimes it's anxiety. And we all know how that can be broken very simply by a simple greeting and an unmediated hello. Automatically there's a new degree of recognition. A lot of our fears are disarmed. Or actually their humanity just comes into full focus. So we, sometimes we race past this possibility for direct greeting. And I think it's because it's so obvious and sometimes oversimplified. But it's worth remembering how hello can be an, an opportunity, an orientation, and especially that it's not something we just say, it's something we do. So what, what could happen if we could take the power of these communications, this direct communication, and extend it internationally and not only that, bring people into kind of a creative exchange, even though we may never meet them in person. I'd like to take you on a brief musical journey, one that starts in Athens and ends halfway around the world. It involves hundreds of people, thousands of miles, and hundreds of hours. But at the heart, it's really about creating this new kind of hello. In the mid-2000s, I was a musician here in Athens, Georgia. I was also teaching in the religion department. And at that time, the US was at its peak with its military intervention in the Middle East and its cultural war on Muslim culture all around the world. The message was, definitely do not say hello. Keep your distance. I had already traveled to the Middle East several times and traveled to Indonesia several times. And the communities I was working with, with music there, definitely did not have the sentiment that was being broadcasted all over the world. Similarly, when I was working in Athens with musicians here, not only did they feel powerless, but they were, com they were confused on how the messages that they were communicating were getting filtered through the media and, pub and, and broadcasted, that they actually weren't against Muslim culture, and neither, neither culture could be communicated clearly. Eventually, both those, those, both those communities I was working with were trying to find a way to connect and directly like, bypass the media and politics. And this is where I had to kind of reconcile something that I was avoiding for years, that I actually was not a protester. I always respected people that could hold the sign and walk, walk and march, but I never did it. And so the guilt for that just kept rising, but I figured we have to do something. And a lot of the people I was working with didn't have that, in, like, that inclination either. And also, what I continually realized is that the media and the political structures were letting people down as far as direct communication between different cultures. So there had to be a third way. There had to be some kind of third position 
that people that wanted to occupy some kind of political voice or communicate to another culture could do. And lastly, I would always come back to this quote by William James. That is, that music can give us ontological messages that non-musical criticism is unable to contradict. And of course, that's kind of a fancy way of saying that music can paint a picture of reality that's more accurate than words at times. So with all these three things combined, I've, and having experienced both in Southeast Asia and in Athens, we tried to find ways to connect people that were working in music in both places. We eventually went to Indonesia several times and started recording music with people all over the island. We crisscrossed the island, recording everywhere from uh, nightclubs and bustling cities to bamboo huts off the grid. And despite looking fairly solemn there, it was actually a very good time. <laughs> um, and people were really interested in the project we had, and they actually responded to the ability to communicate directly to other musicians in around the world, halfway around the world, in Athens specifically. Not only that, they leapt at the opportunity at capturing their craft with the technology we had so they could broadcast what their craft was and that they understood music in a way that was similar to those people in Athens, Georgia. Also, as word spread about the project of connecting people in Athens and Indonesia, people came from all over to record with us. People traveled, like this young man, traveled two days to record with us. And not only that, you can't see it in the picture, but there are actually 30 other people in the studio because they were interested in what was going to happen. They found out this was an opportunity that Americans were interested in their music, and not only that, it was an opportunity for them to see what it was like in a recording studio and feel like they were having some kind of political, musical voice. We also were interested in this music because the music of Java, just as music of Athens, has been influential throughout the world. Composers in the 40s, 50s, and 60s look to Java for inspiration in a lot of the traditional music. And as we all know, Athens has its own influential musical history. And lastly, they were very patient with us. Right? We brought them their recording circumstances that they would no normally never go into. We put microphones in places that they never wanted to really get in the way of. We had headphones. They were performing in spaces they never had. But they saw it, as we did, as an opportunity to, to bridge some kind of sonic solidarity with people halfway around the world. And lastly, uh, when you get to these musical communities, you find very quickly that they're very similar. Right? People are collaborating, they're experimenting, they're trying to make a dollar. So really, what these two scenes had in common, they are, <laughs> we all are, I guess. Um, what these two scenes had in common just kept growing. So eventually after several trips and months over in Southeast Asia and amidst Muslim culture and the traditional music scene, we came back to Athens and we spent two years going through these recordings and trying to pull out loops and segments of songs that we could actually use to build new songs on. We also were mixing and recording the traditional music to introduce people to that musical scene across the, across the world. And similarly, as it was in Indonesia, people leapt at the opportunity to actually work through sounds and collaborate with these people they had never actually seen before. So over 24 musicians and 36 songs later and two years later, we had several, we had several interests interested parties that wanted to keep working with this project, and it's actually still going. I'd like to play you a quick song that we worked on with Peter Buck from REM and a handful of other people in uh, Athens. And it starts off with a sample we recorded in Indonesia, and of course, bridges its way to some music that you might find in Athens.
So that's one of dozens of examples of how we started to answer this question, how you say hello to someone you'll never meet. So of course, reversely, my question for you is, how can you say hello to someone you'll never meet? They can ultimately have an impact on international relations on a larger scale. We all have a local creativity that we can harness, and we all have a breadth of technological tools at our disposal. So my ask for you is, figure that out. Find your way. Say hello to someone you can never meet. And also, remember always, hello is not something you say, it's something you do. Thank you for listening.